The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. I'm Chris Tennyson, and uh, for the past six years, I have taught at Smyrna Middle School. I have taught eight years middle school ESL with a couple of years of elementary in the very beginning in the itinerant days of Rutherford County. Um, I have my doctorate in leadership from Trevecca Nazarene University um, and this fall or actually as of July 2nd officially I will be a coach in Rutherford County at Title I schools but for general ed teachers uh, who have English learners in their classrooms. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like yet. <laughs> uh, I am also the current president of TenTSOL, um, and I highly recommend you all come in September to our conference. At the, it's at the end of September in Franklin. If you live in the local area, it's just a drive for you. If you don't live in the local area, it's worth the investment. Uh, Jan Lucerno, uh, is that her name now? No. Runyon. Thank you. Uh, she mentioned that it's worth it. And then I, in addition, I do teach at uh, adjunct at Trevecca Nazarene University uh, in their uh, ESL endorsement undergraduate and graduate classes. So. Uh, my name is Megan Vahiel, and I've taught ESL for six years at Smyrna Middle School here in Rutherford County. And she's wonderful. Don't, she, she only gives herself a short introduction, but she's wonderful. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to talk today about strategies to turn long-term and language learners into ESL graduates. But our strategies are not just what can I do to scaffold, but they're going to have three components. Um, the three components are we're going to talk about tier, um, the quality of tier one. You, you've got the paper. <coughs> I'm sorry, what is it? What are our three? Quality tier one, um, the whole language as a whole to the part, and uh, the asset perspective and prevention. Um, what is a long-term language learner? Anybody want to give us a definition? Yes, ma'am. Someone who is still in the program after completing six years in the program. Okay, that's the state definition. Anybody else want to add to that? Someone continue. No, go ahead. Someone continually learning the language. And I would add to that that maybe they've plateaued at their language levels. It looks like there could be anywhere from like a 3, 3.5 to, you know, in that kind of intermediate range. And it just doesn't seem like anything that you do gets them beyond that level. Okay, those are all really, really good definitions. Okay, now read the article and see what it says. Um, so if you haven't, or you just came in, this is the website. Um, if you go to drtennyson.weebly.com and then click on PDs, and it's article one. If you need help finding it, just let us know. And I do have one paper copy if anybody needs it. So how many of you would like to add to, these are the two things that I heard the most from what we said, six years or more, um, plateau in uh, language acquisition. Who would like to add after reading this something to that? I think there was a couple of really key points in the, mostly Spanish, move around a lot. Interrupted schooling. Their language is mostly basic, like yeah. conversational. It's not, not a lot of academic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Conversational. K kind of a conversational social fluency, don't you think? Whoops. It says they write like they speak. They write like they speak. And I also find it interesting that it says, because <laughs> this is like my students, Many of my students, not all of them, but they demonstrate disengagement, resistance, and mm -hmm. passiveness. <laughs> that is <laughs> euphemistic. I'm just going to put disengage. <laughs> yeah. 
disengaged. And we know that it's a good thing I didn't teach elementary and teach handwriting. All right. Um, I know y'all said lots more. Uh, what else did we say that we th that we want to put up here? Yes. Along with the disengaged, I think it was right before or right after it said they were stuck. And stuck. So plateau, they're stuck. Okay, they talk like they speak. Yes, ma'am. They don't want to be in ESL anymore because they don't see the point of it. Mm -hmm. they, they know that, you know, ESL, you know, pulls them out of their mainstream class and they don't really identify themselves as, as an ESL anymore. That's why I noticed with my mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. And I've seen the opposite where it's a mm -hmm. safe place mm -hmm. and they have, they come from trauma, maybe their mother died, their baby brother died, and they purposely mm -hmm. just are, and because th that's their safe place. Okay, so it's purposely they don't want to leave the other. That's right, and that does absolutely happens. Um, and they, they think if they keep failing the test, they, how many of you guys get, no, you're like, you could do so much better. Well, you know, I don't want to test out of ESL, Miss Tennyson, and so I'm just not going to do well on the test, yeah, and that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> all right. Like always, can, can we just add, there are typically always gaps. Like, oh, that's a good one, yes. Oops. Always gaps. There's gaps in their learning. All right, how many of you have a student like this in your classroom? Even in the upper elementary, the technical six years hasn't come in yet, right? There are, it may be, in, you know, but you know that it doesn't seem like they're going to be going into middle school. You know what I'm saying? Um, everybody kind of think of that student, and as we talk, um, then we're going to give you some strategies on how to, to, to kind of help them fight this and help give you some in information to help advocate for your students at your schools because that's also a huge issue. Um, how many of you are in, uh, like you're the one or two person in your whole district? How many of you are one or two in your own school? Like you're the only ESL teacher in your school? How many of you have a team at your school? Okay, I know, I know some people do. Um, how many of you, despite that, still feel like your team is isolated? Sometimes, y'all don't, I know. Okay. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about um, is strategies for quality tier one and why it's so important. Um, so the first thing is just how important it is. Our long-term language learners are in tier one classes all day. They don't see you very often. So it's important that those classes um, are giving them what they need. Uh, intentionally placing them in appropriate classes um, and knowing and doing that um, on purpose they're in classes where you know they are and you want them to be. Not everyone has that opportunity, but um, for our school, we have a lot of students and we found that it worked for us to know who those teachers were, to place all of our English learners with the same math teacher in seventh grade. So that teacher we could have a strong relationship with and they were learning strategies to help these students. Not that every teacher can't learn that, but when one is focused on them, um, it seems to, did you have something? I was gonna say, high school doesn't work that way necessarily. They get put in, in whatever class might be open. That's true. But <laughs> and we don't always have, we don't have the opportunity to get them even in classes we want. Here's what happens, we turn our schedules in first. Our kids are placed, SPED kids are placed first, and then gr uh, other students are placed in afterwards. So, and then we've even had to move general ed students out of a class. You're, you're blessed. Yes. You're blessed. Well, just yes. to piggyback on that, though, I think that once you establish, like for me, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm finally starting to establish in my school. Once you have that, I think if there's not a big turnover with the teacher, um, you build relationships and you know which teachers work really well with ELs. And then, it, like, in my school, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I was able to, like, we have an Algebra one um, ELL class that I push into because we noticed that our ELLs, they were not doing well with Algebra. So because of that, because the principal was open to that, you know, you start to find out which, which teachers are more open to having ELs 
and which ones really work well with them. And then they'll start to track them a little bit more. But I think there just does need to be that I open communication. I think you also said something that's extremely important. Your administration has to be on board yeah. with that. And if that is not the case in your school, then it's, it's still not, it, it's still, you have to try and make your voice one that could be heard. It doesn't always work. Not everybody. We know we're talking ideal, but we are talking about if you're now that WIDA does count 10 percent, we have more backbone to what we say. And so when you go to your administrator, you said you can tell that you, you understand that and in high school you got there are a lot of LTLLs. And so you say, we want them to graduate so that we can improve our graduation out of English ESL rate. And these are the things that you could, we could do. And you have to become an advocate and speak up for your students. And now there's accountability to back up what we're saying. Um, so yes. The argument that I got is that if we put all of the ELLs with one teacher, then that teacher's scores are going to go down and his or her evaluation will go down. Well, research shows that students, uh, teachers who have English learners in their class, their growth scores skyrocket. So, um, and since, if you'll look at the new matrix, it's mostly just growth. And uh, you, there's, there's so much out there to, to disprove that. And so, but you don't wanna put a bunch of ELs with a teacher that's resistant because then their scores could possibly go down. We're going to talk about some resources to give teachers when when you're when you're working with them. Yes, ma'am. Do you find out that most of your long were identified as fed as well? No. I, I feel like we have some definitely, and we address a little bit of that later on. Um, and that can be so complicated um, because that definitely changes what you can do with their schedule and what services they need. Right, because you have to choose whether they're going to take the sped English or the ESO English, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yes, yep. not take up all their spots. We're talking about long-term language learners that have not been identified for SPED yet. So that's a, that's a really good point, though. Yeah. Um, and, and we don't have an ideal situation at, our, at the school we were at, but um, we have had a lot of really good opportunities and helpful admin. Um, so again, if you can't do it, it's obviously not everything's possible. We, especially with our long-term language learners, they are not with our intermediate students. We, we don't want them to sink or swim, like the article said, because they're probably going to sink then. They need help. That's why they're not moving on. But they also need to be around native peers, interacting with them, hearing the high academic vocabulary. So we might have three or four in similar classes together so that if an EA needs to push in or we need to step into that class um, or that teacher needs to do differentiation, it just works better if possible. Um, monitoring the student progress and communicating with teachers often. Um, that's just for all our students, but especially long-term language learners. In the article, it mentioned how sometimes teachers don't know they have ELs in their class, um, even though you sent them the list and you talked to them about it. So um, just continuing to um, have those conversations with them so they know that that student is a long-term language learner and they need help. And it's not that they're just not trying, but they might not have that academic language, and so they might not want to do it because they can't. Um, and so just constant communication so they know who's in their room so that they know what they can do. The next part of tier one is sheltered instruction. Now sheltered instruction um, being when you have one of the core classes and you pull out students um, just for ELA, just for science that are only ESL students. And that most of the time is not appropriate for long-term language learners. Like we said, they need to be with native peers. They need to hide, have the high academic vocabulary conversations on grade level. Um, Sometimes it might be appropriate, especially if you know they're um, a SLIFE student with interrupted schooling and they're, they have such a big gap and you have that opportunity in your school. Um, but really sheltered instruction would go with that prevention um, in elementary school. If you can and have those uh, social studies classes, science classes for beginners, uh, they need to be on grade level. You need to be introducing them to content vocabulary even when they've only been here a year because they will become a long-term language learner because they'll have those gaps that the article mentioned. They won't have that language, and so they'll only have their basic communication skills. Um, and so it definitely is hard. I teach sheltered science in middle school, um, and so they don't get all of the eighth grade standards by the end of the eighth grade year, but they're exposed to all of that. So hopefully when they go to high school, 
they have a better grasp of it and they've at least been exposed to things that their peers have been exposed to. So when they have to go to those hard science classes in high school, they're better prepared and are, have a better chance of a success in getting out of ESL and, and graduating. And I'll give you a little data to go with that. Um, at our school, when, let's see, when was the last time we had good data? Um, anyway, <laughs> the last time we had good data, uh, her science growth scores were 12%. She had, uh, so she grew higher than almost uh, anybody, any, any of the science teachers at our school. She had that, or 12 points or whatever that is, I can't remember now. But she had very high for her sheltered beginners and she had a few uh, intermediates in there. That's, the, that's why sheltered instruction is a prevention, but we also, if it's done, right. if it's done correctly, and it, uh, it can be done in math, I mean, it, it depends on what your resources are. It depends on how well you train the teachers that you work with. Um, but uh, it can, it, sheltered instruction, we're about to do sheltered math at two of our middle schools uh, for some of our uh, bubble kids that may be long-term language learners that we're wanting to push out, um, push over that thing. Um, but uh, they're not gonna be sheltered with beginners. So. And even if those beginners, they can't be sheltered, but they're in the gen ed class and that teacher thinks, oh, they're, you know, they're brand new, they don't need to hear this. No, they need to hear it. Obviously they can't do everything, but again, you have to expose them to the content right away. You can't keep it from them. So I um, sometimes um, do advanced ed visits um, as, a, as a teacher observer. And uh, I went to a high school recently and they had a beginner class and they had a born here student in that class with a bunch of beginners. It, the class was small. Um, I'm not even gonna talk about the quality of the instruction in that class. But scheduling wise, totally inappropriate. A born here child, when they're in high school, unless there is no other option, because sometimes you're the only person and you're there for two or three periods and you only have 12 kids and you have to put them all in a class together because that's your, your scheduling, okay? Um, that's sometimes, an, but this, that was not true at this school. And um, this young man probably had a one or a two on his WIDA. Whatever reason that was true, they, based, they, they um, were scheduling solely on WIDA scores. Okay, we know that's not appropriate. Just because you have a two on the WIDA, if you were born here, there's no reason that you should be in a beginner ESL class. Okay, so that's why I'm putting interaction with native peers. You, there's, it's, you've got to be so careful with that. Um, consistent encouragement. I taught, um, in a, I taught at a school where we inherit, I inherited uh, students, elementary students from a different system. And one of the first things I learned while I was teaching, this was years ago, was that these children had a deficit perspective. Okay, they did not, they were, they were ESL, they'd been in uh, the system their whole lives, they were born here, but they did not think what they had or what they brought to the classroom had any value. They were often shoved at the back of the classroom, they, um, they had no self-worth, you know, and um, kids need constant encouragement. They need to know that they have so much to bring. And long-term language learners who are still ESL, and like you said, I don't, can't remember over here who said it, don't see the point of ESL, need that encouragement and they need to understand why they're in this classroom. They think it's because they're dumb. And we know that's not true. How many of us speak two languages, you know? And, and so we need to make sure that our students understand that that's an asset. Um, how many of you have had those kids and their parents come to you and go, my kid doesn't need ESL? Or in Spanish through a translator, probably not with the Southern accent, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they say, my child doesn't need ESL. He speaks ESL or speaks English just fine, right? So if we don't communicate with parents and we don't collaborate with our teachers to let them know, hey, yeah, your son listens well and speaks well, but Here's his reading struggle, or here is his writing struggle. These are the things that we are gonna work on in this class. I always tell students uh, when I get them and parents say, I don't want that child in your class, and it's not about me. Number one is, I have to remember, it's not about me, okay? Most of the parents coming to us, it's not about us. I have to remember, it's, they, they believe strongly in their best interest of their child. They are coming at it from the same aspect you are. I say to them, give me a six weeks, this was years ago, <laughs> give me six weeks, give me a nine weeks, give me half a nine weeks. If at that 
you know, Mark, you decide that this is not in the best interest of your child. I will respect your decision. Never had a parent come back to me and say, I don't want my child in your class. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and that's not because of me, but because it's I, the quality of the education that we offer, the parents start to say, oh, wow, you know, this is in the best interest of my child. I don't want my kid in that, in that class with that kid that doesn't speak English. Well, I'm sorry, ma'am. That's not where it's going to be. Your son is, we, now we do have a large population, so we are able to group according to, to, to language level. But, you know, your son is going to be with everybody that's speaking English. Um, they're not going to be in that class with that kid that doesn't speak English. But if they are, then you can always say, I do groups. And while your son is doing independent work, I'll be meeting with the beginners. And while um, the beginners are doing independent work, I'll be meeting with your child. Okay, I promise you that the academic rigor of my class is, suits your child's needs. Um, and then I love ILPs, and she's going to talk about them a little bit too. Tangible, visible goals. ILPs are going to be easier for us to go to teachers and say, this e are the goals. And I'm going to come back in nine weeks, and I'm going to ask you, what's your evidence for having done some of these things? So. How many of y'all remember the term whole language? Anybody here taught long enough to remember the term whole language and how it got a bad rap? Okay, and it got a bad rap because people thought we didn't have to teach phonics. Now we use the term balanced literacy, okay, which is a really a better term. Uh, we want to teach everything together. And Trey Duke, who is our RTI uh, Title I supervisor in our county, will tell you this. If you put a child in RTI too soon, because you're concentrating on the part, not the whole, you're going to damage them. If you want to prevent long-term language learners, don't jump on the RTI bandwagon. RTI is phenomenal. If you truly think there's a learning disability, they should be in RTI. But uh, in elementary especially, they should not go into RTI to the um, detriment of ELD. Okay? So, RTI. I think, uh, at first I was not happy with it. I love the way our school has rolled, our county and our school in general has rolled it out. I am a big fan of RTI. We've seen some huge growth with, with some of our long-term language learners that truly they, people thought were sped, they weren't, they needed um, help. We've also seen where it's not been effective with children. Uh, w most of the sixth graders that we had two years ago that were in RTI have been making growth through RTI, but not on the WIDA. So there's a problem, there's, there's a disconnect there, okay? So you always have to think what is in the best interest of the child. It is not in the best interest of the child to stop receiving ELD services, ever. Um, unless, and you know, how many of y'all really think you know when a child has a disability and you think, how many of us have taught long enough? We know it, we can see it. We might not be able to, and we can usually do it through evidence in whether we pull up their reading or their writing, or we talk to them and we take copious um, notes. We can come up with evidence to show why we think that's something other than them learning English. And I hate to use the word language because language impairment is also a disability. Um, so when you're thinking about RTI, um, you have to make sure that you have the data to prove it. Um, and you have to remember, it does not replace ELD. It never replaces ELD. We, that's where we kind of made a mistake this year. So anyway. Um, yeah, so ELD is English language development, that block of time where you are serving the student. And so for the long-term language learner, that's going to be that time that you have them in a separate class. It's a small group. Um, and every student needs ELD. And that, like she said, we kind of failed at. And it's also one of those things of we don't have an ideal, um, an ideal schedule, an ideal school, because if they're served in RTI, there's no time to get them for ELD. And so I'm sure in your schools you have the similar issues where sometimes if they're in, if they're served by SPED or they're served by RTI, it's hard to find the time where you can serve them. Um, but they all need ELD because that's the place where they're going to get that whole language um, instruction where they are going to get an opportunity to uh, have more engagement with the academic vocabulary that they're missing. Uh, in the large class, in the gen ed classes, the teacher doesn't always have time to model those things that they're missing in the academic <coughs> conversations. Um, while they're interacting with their native peers, they also need to hear um, that academic language and vocabulary from the 
from the teacher and see it modeled. Um, one of the books that we're going to reference um, at the end is Unlocking English Language Learners Potential. And there's a, uh, a chapter in here on academic conversations and how important they are for the long-term language learner and all ESL students. And in the ELD time is when they can have that um, intentional one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, and so it's so important. Um, it's very important if you can that it's on grade, that they're grouped by grade level and proficiency levels. Obviously, that's not always an option. So being able to differentiate and have those different groups. We found at our school, um, when we put those advanced, um, long -term, more long-term language learners or close to exiting students together, they push each other so much more. And that's the place where those students who are disengaged can find engagement. Um, Dr. Tennyson had a few students this year that um, one who, who moved in, didn't have data from his school, had to test him, tested into ESL. Um, and definitely had some gaps, but was not super excited to be in ESL in eighth grade when he didn't think he was before. Though we've also found some students who've been in ESL in our county don't think they're in ESL and they just don't know. But, um, but he, she really built a relationship with him. And when he had those goals and knew he wanted to exit, which he did, um, he was excited and he enjoyed the class and he, um, it was really beneficial to him, I think. Uh, and there were many other students in that class, students as well, I think, who built on each other in that I want to exit, I know what my goal is. And also, um, not really related to this, but this, when the students have their goals, I think sometimes students don't know, like you said, why they should exit ESL um, or they think, I want to stay in it forever. Um, but giving them those those reasons why they should. And so like in eighth grade, we tell them, well, when you go to high school, you won't have as many opportunities. You won't get to have as many classes that you choose. Um, you know, and sometimes even if that's not 100% true, I don't know. But making sure they know the opportunities that open up to them and the, the benefits of exiting um, and making it sound exciting to them um, and not just like, oh, it's just like a label. But no, like it's a good thing and these are all the things that you can do. Um, we, you know, we have a large population at Walter, and we run into that problem all the time. You know, they want them in SPED, or they want them in RTI, is usually, you know, they want all RTI instead of, and we've just been saying, and, but it's always a struggle, we've just been saying, listen, ESL is um, federally mandated, RTI is not, we get them. But then when the next testing cycle comes, you know, when they do another benchmark, it's the same mm -hmm. thing. We want them in RTI. I can't go to RTI. And we've had to like redo our schedules before in the middle of the year. And just really, I don't know. I mean, what do you, how do you handle that? Is there, okay, so um, for us, uh, this first year we did this with our sixth graders who rolled up and had been in RTI in elementary. We kept them for an hour. We had their, we were their tier three and we allowed them and went, we, they were in tier two. So if they need to be in that tier two, that shorter time period, I think like, because there are some things, some benefits to RTI. We don't do as much, because we're middle school, we don't do as much of that focused, intense um, uh, teaching to read because we have so much that we do have to teach. Um, but so the, I think tier two, if they're for a half an hour, I don't know how your schedule works, so I can only speak to what we do, uh, tier two, and then we keep them for the hour. Of all the students we did that with and pulled out of RTI this year, there's only one, one that we're going to put back in to a full hour of allowed to be scheduled where RTI is the, is the main focus. Um, I think you need to remind the RTI people that it's a part that they're not getting the language all put together. And what happens to English learners and why they, because a lot of times even before RTI existed, they'd pull them out and still do that, but, but, but. Well, I'm sorry, I know they don't got that yet. Or, I know, I use my Southern all the time. Oh, I know they don't have that skill yet, but we gotta move on so they can learn the whole language because they don't have the skills to hook on where that but goes into uh, the blue bike um, barrel down the bumpy road. You know what I'm saying? They don't understand how that B fits in and they can't picture that blue bike barreling down that bumpy road, okay? 
So we have to make sure that the, that the RTI people understand. And in our county, we're fortunate that our Mr. Duke will, if, if we don't think it's a SPED issue, they're gonna, have to, they're gonna have to document as much why they think it's a SPED issue. If they think there is some sort of learning disability, sometimes you have to release them. And that's a hard, it's a hard call. Um, we're, that's something that is still a lot of research out there about, so. If I could kind of add to that, yes. I think if you're elementary, um, it takes time, but building a relationship with your administrators and the day that they said, you are not doing the schedule anymore for ESL and we're doing a school schedule, changed my world and life. I don't have to fight with people anymore about the schedule because the administrators do the schedule. And also when we have our monthly data meeting and talk about all of the kids who could maybe need RTI, but their ESL, that's not really an issue because the ESL time doesn't change. That's the time. Now, if they need also RTI, we always determine, is it a language? development issue they're staying in ESL are they at this language level they obviously have to go to ESL are they you know a higher language level like a 3.6 but a, but they're not a long-term learn they're elementary so maybe they need to go to RTI but then they come to ESL at a different time so if you can try not to have to schedule that yourself be let the whoever else can schedule those things schedule that but it takes time of you being an advocate and building relationships fighting for your job and what is important for English learners and knowing all this stuff because if you can speak intelligently about this and convince your uh, administrators to come along with your, the way that really it needs to be thought about you, it, it'll reduce the amount of you know boxing matches you get into with RTI. I think you hit the key on the head. It's building relationships. And it's hard. It's hard when you have administrative turnover or teacher turnover or RTI coach turnover. Those things can, can be a challenge. Or when you don't. Or when you don't. And that person has been there along with the cement between the bricks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard. And they get, they get listened to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to go, then we're going to look, look a little bit on strategies. Um, we're going to reference this book again. There's a really great chapter in this book, and I'm going to, uh, um, if you are in Rutherford County, don't tell Nona, I told you, no, she's on camera, she's going to know, um, <laughs> that she bought some of these for us to use as resources. So if you're in Rutherford County and you're interested in this book, I would love to do a, lead, a, lead a, a book study this fall or this spring, um, depending on what all our times come out to be. Uh, this is a great resource. Um, I think this is the resource where you pick strategies to share with your grade level teachers. Okay. It's um, Unlocking English Learners Potential, pot potential Strategies for Making Content Accessible by Diane strayer fenner and Sydney Sidner. Um, it's from Corwin Press. Um, and if you found the link to her Weebly, it's on the end of the Prezi, so. Um, but it's called Supporting English Learners Reading for Multiple pur pur Purposes Through Use Scaffolding Text-Dependent Questions. There's a lot of really great strategies in this book. Um, and we have to make that whole part to language. So what I am a big fan of and, uh, is making units around a topic. Um, and I did one for my um, advanced learners. So I have to tell a little story. I, the eighth graders that I had this year, I just taught eighth grade this year for the first time ever. Um, I had had them in sixth grade, I had had them in seventh grade, and I had had them in eighth grade. For the longest time, I only taught seventh and eighth grade at schools in Rutherford County that only had seventh and eighth grade. I had two years worth of curriculum, even though I never, I always, you know, uh, did it up. I, I always revamped it every year as things would change. I had those novels. How many of us all have those novels, those go-to novels that we really like to, to teach? Well, they had, had had every all the good stuff. You know what I'm saying? They'd had it all. So this year I had to find a new novel. And if you all have not read Dragon Wings by Lawrence Yep, um, we read Dragon Wings by Lawrence Yep, which is a... I, this now comes on, my students will tell you everything is my favorite, but it's now one of my favorite novels. And you could read it in high school. We did a whole unit on immigration, on uh, the China at that time, the Tang Dynasty. 
which I didn't know about. I had to learn a lot of really neat um, uh, world history type things. Uh, we talked a lot about immigration. It came, we did it in the fall. Um, we know that immigration is a hot button issue in our society. I use commonlit.org. Um, I should have put a link to that on my website and I didn't, but commonlit.org is um, better than News ELA because it's free and it's all free, okay? Free, I'm sorry, I love um, uh, News ELA, but anything that forces you to pay after a certain point only becomes useful to me to that point. And Common Lit has a philosophy that they want to keep, always keep it free because that's their, that's their mission. But Common Lit had some great articles that I could pull in about immigration and it kind of went along with the story. A lot of them we found, and I found uh, something from PBS that I couldn't find the video for, but it had a lot of uh, articles from PBS about um, uh, Chinese immigration in the early 1900s. So I pulled in all these nonfiction resources. We read this fiction story, which is, it was a historical fiction, so it wasn't fantasy. Um, we identified in the parts of the story, you know, this is, oh wow, we read about, they were able to make all these connections, as well as talking about all those deep literature things. We have Asian, we have Korean at, at our school. Um, we don't have any Chinese. We had Korean, and even though the characters were not Korean, they were Asian. And for the first time I had a novel, because most of my novels are about Hispanics and Central Americans, I can't lie. Um, but the first time I had a novel where my Korean students could identify with the characters. Okay? And we, they were most interested in the fact, and we learned this, that uh, the Chinese were not allowed to bring their wives. They are the only culture group in history up until modern within the last year that have been uh, uh, um, denied 100% access to immigration to the United States. And when they first came, they were not allowed to apply for any sort of pathway to citizenship. Um, so we can go into why that is. Um, but that happened, and I thought I grabbed it. But what I do, and I'm not gonna find it, it's green, so it would have been easy to find. Okay, what I do is I um, pick 10 to 20 vocabulary words, not for the book, not for the article, but that will be found throughout the whole unit. And that becomes my vocabulary intensely that I'm gonna teach. I don't teach it all at one time, okay? For instance, I, for my beginners, I did a unit on um, uh, the wagon, the, the 1800s, you know, the wagon train west. I can't even think. Uh, westward expansion, thank you. I did a unit on westward expansion. We read a bunch of, an article on the third grade level about westward expansion from uh, Common Lit. Common Lit also has some really great test type prep questions where, and it's so minimal. And Common Lit also could do something really, if you tell it not to, the, uh, the student only can read so much, then they have to answer a question, then it unlocks the next section. You have to tell it to, it doesn't do it automatically. Um, and I got all this from collaborating with one of our eighth grade teachers that was teaching the advanced um, eighth graders. So I didn't get, this was something that when I said, oh, you know, this is what they're reading, and sometimes I would pick an article that they were reading in what we called our CARS class. We had a, a, a an extra reading class for our advanced kids. The ones that weren't in RTI, weren't in SPED, and weren't in ESL. So those have to be the advanced ones, right? Um, but we were doing a lot of the same stuff that they were doing. But I picked a third grade article, we read it, we used the vocabulary throughout all that, and then our culminating project was, so um, this was a nice lady that was one of my Trebecca students that I put to work when she came. Here's their journey quilt, okay? This is also a journey story if you all have never read The Circuit. It talks a lot about his journey coming to the United States. It was um, in the 1900s. So we connected this journey story to what we read about westward expansion to this journey story and then they wrote their own, okay? We made quilts based on this. But we, I've picked sentence frames because I'm a huge fan of sentence frames out of this because the first thing in this story is La Frontera is a word I often heard when I was a child living in La, uh, Rancho Blanco. I heard it for the first time. So I made a lot of sentence frames so they could use this 
and create those for their everything connected. Now, did they have to use those 20 words of vocabulary? No, because some of them were historically significant. They were content, they were tier one, tier two, tier three. If you uh, went to the read to be ready um, presentation that Shannon and um, uh, Becky did, okay? They were from all of those. So um, that's where I'm saying, if you, you need to do this with your long-term language learners as well, because you wanna build that whole understanding of that concept. Because we were talking about immigration, our academic conversations, sometimes unplanned, and you know, sometimes those are the best ones, went very deep, okay? And um, that was the best part about it was I was able to create the scaffolding for the deep conversations. I was able to create, um, you know, eighth grade history. It was an eighth grade history concept. I was able to create my writing. Now, this was after we took the WIDA, okay, so maybe that whole unit wasn't reflected on my WIDA scores, but it will be reflected when they move on to Smyrna High School next year, okay? And if you ask Lori, um, she has a, a young man that I had, she uh, is very close to a young man that was once our student, and I found his quilt, and you have to ask her what it was like. I sent it to her just this year because I was getting rid of stuff in my classroom, and I try to get my kids to send their quilts home, and they wouldn't take them home and wouldn't take them home, and this is the first year I've ever had to throw them away, and it broke my heart. I mean, I have, st you can ask her, I have stacks of stuff. So, does anybody have any questions about that concept? Um, I do. Yes. <laughs> On your, uh, so you said you have mostly Hispanic children. No, we have a, a lot. Of, we do have 60% um, now Hispanic when you say, it used to be uh, 40 Hispanic, 40 Arabic, and like 30 Korean. Uh, in fact, at some point in time, it was 70 Korean. But yeah, we have a, we have a high number of Hispanics. So haven't you, like your westward expansion literature, is it from the First Nations perspective or is it from the colonist perspective? Because um, that will, in my opinion. Probably the colonist perspective, yeah. definitely. But a great way to pull it in would be from, the, for, from that. Do you, are you aware of any uh, publishers that will do something like Westward Expansion from the First Nations perspective? That, would... that is not, not an area of expertise. But one, one thing I've learned, uh, my Carol Salva, one of my Twitter um, guru people that I know, says the, um, the, we're as smart as the room, and we are the room. The smartest person in the room is the room. So um, if anybody, that's why, you know, if you all have resources that we can share, that's a great thing to do. So um, I don't, and I apologize for that. So, yes. The only thing I've ever heard about that is actually on Brain Pop with Christopher Columbus and uh, they kind of, Tim and Moby kind of give it, give the Christopher Columbus talk a little spin and talk about, you know, it's his mistake and everything. Um, so that, I mean, I haven't read all the middle school level books on Westward Expansion, but I talk about it in fourth and fifth grade also. So Brain Pop does Talk I saw about the it. He did. The, and I know big. reading it to Z, we did one. They have an actually pretty good one called uh, uh, who, the, who Discovered the Americas? Mm -hmm. Americas, plural, the, con the right. continents that talks. You know, that I think there the are present. books out there, but you'd I have just, to really search. But I haven't them. heard, like, think, since um, the establishment of the U.S., I haven't found. So, for example, Westward Expansion is after 1776. So I haven't found a lot of literature from the indigenous perspective, which our, our Hispanic and Latino children are the direct descendants mm -hmm. of that perspective. So right. it seems like we should be teaching it from that perspective. Um, well, I wasn't going to rewrite the history curriculum no, to, to do my no, unit. Um, no, I don't have any resources. Um, and that, that is something I hadn't even considered. So you've made me think that's a good thing. So <clears throat> this summer um, is my summer of reading uh, fiction. I love to read. How many of y'all love to read? Okay. Uh, Projectlit.com is started out of this, this guy right here, Jared Amato. And I found him probably the beginning of May. I can't remember when I started talking about it. But I found him because... Uh, through another Twitter thing that I do called ELL Chat Book Club, we had read, um, I'm not your 
typical Mexican daughter. I think, is that right? Or something like that. Um, and uh, the, he was posting about it being chosen as one of their, their selections for next year. And I thought, oh, wow, he's choosing this book. And if you've not, I'm not your typical Mexican daughter. Perfect Mexican daughter. Thank you, ma'am. I always want to put the word typical in there, and I don't know why. I'm not your perfect Mexican daughter. It's a high school book. I don't have a copy of it because I gave it away to a student, and it's still circulating the eighth grade girls that I taught last year. Um, but um, it's a great read. And um, I thought, well, I need more. Why am I not, you know, why am I not out there searching for sources that my students want to read? And so he has started a group where you can participate and read. The best reading teachers are the best readers. If, and it's a challenge, I'm telling y'all. But we need to be out there reading literature that our students can see their reflection in. Okay, and so Megan and I both read this one, which is uh, considered a YA, but we know that in high school, or a, and middle grades, but we know that in high school you can read a middle grades, especially for ESL. It's a mall unbound. It's about a girl from Pakistan, um, and she, um, uh, I don't want to give too much of it away, but it's a, it's a lot about, it's not about English. It's about living in a small community and being ruled by that community and helping make cha uh, changes. And um, she actually reads and writes. And it's also about, and you would appreciate this one, the Western view that we can come in and save. Because the, uh, the literacy center that they create has no students because the person who owns the town wouldn't want them to go there and everybody's afraid to go there but they send her because she already knows how to read and write but, but she's the one representative that they can take pictures of while she's there so but what they don't know is that opens other doors for her to the internet which she didn't know existed it's, it's a great read um that, amal a-m-a-l unbound and then amira's voice was about an immigrant young lady who it doesn't like to talk how many of our students you know can talk and you know have deep thought talk but they won't talk in front of their native peers she sings and i can't remember this is one of the first ones i read so i've kind of forgotten somewhat of about did you read it's this a, one yeah um it, it was the first one i read too it, she's kind of she's lived in america her whole life or for most of it and so she is very americanized but um kind of about her culture and how the thing her family and her religion and how that's viewed um by her by her friends and by the people at her school um and even though she she knows english and she is american how her culture um kind of that identity search of who she is um, and what her voice is um, uh, the reason I have these up here are the long-term language learners are often our, um, they've, they've gotten into activities that have not promoted their own personal growth. Let's just put it that way, okay? So they're in gangs, they are, uh, or, or, or they're gangster wannabes, or um, they feel isolated from both cultures. How many of us have those high school kids that, the reason they join a gang, and this is really true, we had a huge Laotian gang in Murfreesboro uh, for many years that has really died down as our Laotian population has become more acculturated and more, or our Murfreesboro has a huge place for them now. And so that we have less trouble with that type of, of gang because they've, they've uh, uh, come into our, but if you have students that are in gangs. These are African American mostly. I think this is this one. Uh, the reason I picked this one is because it's set in Smyrna, Tennessee. Um, set in Middle Tennessee. So you should read The Serpent King. Um, Jeff uh, Zeitner uh, is from Nashville. Uh, he works, has a full time job, and he's an author on the side, though I don't know how he does that. Um, but that's why I brought this one. But these two are award winners. And then The Hate You Give, which I did not bring. Um, but our kids can really identify with the social isol isolation of being a culture different than the one we're living in. We live in the South. The South is a, an amazing place to live. I love living in the South. I was not born in the South. My, my mother came here, fell in love. My parents did. But there is still area for growth in the South. And so we still have some racial tensions in places. And when you read these books with our English learners, this one is prose, guys. I mean, uh, um, this is free verse. So you can give this to a student, and they're not going to be as intimidated by it. But the deep intellectual conversations 
that academic conversation you can have over this novel, which I read in two hours. I could not put it down. Great audio, Jason Reynolds, one of the most prolific African-American authors for- um, She has so many books on this, Jason Reynolds, and they're all so good. Yes, they are. I'm gonna pass these around. Don't lose this one. Nikki Stone autographed it to me, so it's one of my favorites. But um, definitely uh, check out Project Lit if you're on Twitter, if you're not. Um, I think if they have if a Facebook Google page If you Google it, too. they have a website okay. too. Um, and there's so many of them. And to connect it to the long-term language learners that a lot of times they do struggle to find their identity and they, they maybe don't fit in with all the Spanish kids. And someone said this yesterday at one of the sessions, like because they don't speak Spanish fluently, but then they don't speak English fluently too. And where do they fit? Um, and so many of these books are, I just feel like they're, they're about such deep things and, sub, and identity and culture but they're really approachable for middle school or high school, um, which I think is what we need. And I think, I think it's the second article on the website mm -hmm. talks about just because a book has been read in, in seventh grade for the past 10 years doesn't mean it's the best book to teach. And especially with our students who are so diverse that if they can't connect to it, they can't find themselves in it, they're not gonna be engaged and their reading's not gonna grow. And Jared Amato, one of his things is he, we need to revisit the canon when what we think is appropriate. Um, he has taught high school for a long time and he does not want to teach the Scarlet Letter to a bunch. He teaches in Maplewood High School in Nashville, which is a high gang area. He's like, it's not appropriate for me to read with these kids. They don't see themselves. Nikki Stone said she loves to read, but she said the three African-American people that she saw in the books that she read were, um, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, what kind of African-American, uh, um, and then the others were, they were either servants or subservient type characters. How do our students feel valued, including our Hispanics? Our, like I said, Dragon Wings was the first book that I brought to the table where my students, my Asian students were able to identify. So um, you, you, we have to search out those mirrors that books can be. All right. Yeah, so um, individual learning plans, we heard a lot about this morning, so I won't say a lot, but um, while they are a little scary, I think, because that's a lot more on our plate, they are gonna be really good. I think um, having to do them is gonna provide us with that data and that information that we need to share with the grade level teachers that we want to see uh, in the goal setting. And I think will give us that tangible thing to talk to the student about and say, this is where you are, this is where you want to go. Um, so just, I think, even though they're sorry, embracing them, sharing, you know, being okay with collaborating with the grade level teachers and for the long-term language learners, for them to see that I think is really important because they will under, understand it as far as um, knowing that, that they can reach those goals and, um, and to see that um, tangible. And so, and that all teachers should be using them. Like we said, you, the grade level teacher should know that that student is an, e, is an EL and they should know what their goals are. And I think that will, this will provide that information they need. I think it'll also be a great thing for students to see themselves, especially the ones that we're talking about that are, can, cogn can, can deal with that goal setting. And their parents, because like you said, sometimes their parents are like, they don't need ESL, they know English, they speak way better than I do, but for their parents to see, well, this is where we want them and we want you to partner with them because that will definitely push them and have that support from home. <clears throat> okay, um, asset perspective. Um, <sighs> How do we change that mindset of, of our fellow faculty members to see our students as having a rich, diverse background? It is not the same background as mine, okay? But if whether I grow up in um, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which I did not, but whether I grew up in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, or uh, Sel, Sel, San Salvador, or, or um, grow up in New York City, or I grow up in Berlin, it is, those are all different backgrounds, yes or no. So we have to quit saying that student doesn't have background knowledge. <laughs> that student has different background knowledge. And how do we tap into that background knowledge when we're using, trying to create literacy with them? And then, okay, well, if this is their background knowledge, and I, but I know I've got to teach them things that are not their background knowledge, what are those things, what can I do that's gonna help them understand that better? Okay, how can I use what they have to learn the new things? And we all do it all the time, right? How many of us ever thought, I did not think I would be an ESL teacher when I was 16 sitting in the classroom? I, had, I didn't even know they existed in the world, you know? Um, 
each student has a value. We have to foster their own belief that they can grow. Those students that have plateaued since fifth grade, they, if, and if they're still plateauing through middle school and, and they get them as a freshman in high school, it's, you know, they don't believe in themselves anymore. You know, because if they've plateaued on the WIDA, they probably plateaued, they probably get C's. If they're a 3.5 or, you know, whatever, a 3.7, they're probably getting C's. I'm passing my classes. I don't know what the problem is, you know. And when you say you can do so much more, what's wrong with who I am right now? You know, there's nothing wrong with who you are. But there's still, we can always grow. So, um, and then we create leaders out of long-term language learners. And I'm going to pick, I'm going to say a name of a student who we are extremely proud of. Um, we have office workers in middle school. And um, Miss Stephanie, our secretary, has asked us, she's trying to get bilingual students to come to the office to work. And so we have one that they're only supposed to do it for a semester, but she kept her all year. Um, and she graduated out of ESL, so you don't get her. You, you'll, 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 you'll monitor her. Um, but you'll want her. You'll want to pull her in. Um, she uh, is a leader. And because her leadership within her group that was my class and some of those reluctant that kid that moved in from new york that didn't think he needed esl um, because of her leadership and her friendship with them she was able to help other students see the value of of what we were doing and she was able to help them see that there was a value to um to having two languages our school has done a great job, I think, in the last few years of really valuing our students' dual language, uh, their emergent biliteracy. Um, and uh, she is an amazing young lady. And our secretary helped us grow that leadership because we kind of passed her on to her. And then the office, Mr. Luker, our secretary, they all were like, oh, my God, we, we don't know what we would do without her. You know, she was, plus she has a maturity. But she also became an advocate for her own self. She learned to be a leader. She, her grand, her, she had a grandparent, an aunt or something, die in El Salvador the day, one of the days she was supposed to take the WIDA test. And she came to school and she said to me, now granted, WIDA testing goes on for a while. It's not a big deal to me to change a student around. But she came to me and she said, I can't test today. She had her own voice. She knew what to say to me. And she was able to tell me. And of course, I, if, even if she hadn't asked, I would have said, I would have moved her. But she asked. And so we have to treat our, teach our students to ask. I have a value and I have a worth. And my voice is worth listening to. And so um, it was a very powerful moment for me because she asked. Um, and then we had a couple of other students um, that are quiet leaders that if they, you know you have them in your class, if they go along, Everybody else will go along. And if they don't go along, nobody else will go along. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We've had a few of those over the years. Um, and uh, so we have to teach our children to be leaders and the, good, the, the kind of leaders that will pull everyone up and not pull everyone down. Um, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, and just that the, the long-term language learner would see the amount of English and the growth they've had as a strength, like they are close to testing out or they have learned so much English and that they would see that as a strength and can be a role model to the newer ESL students, to the newcomers, um, which will build their confidence and let them see um, themselves as a leader, I think. And I think the other ESL students seeing this girl work in the office, sometimes the ESL students don't see themselves, you know, at the pep rally or out in front doing this or um, certain things. And so to see somebody in a leadership role in the school, I think helps them see themselves more of like, what, what can I, you know, grow to become? We're for, at our, at our school, we're 40% um, not ESL, we're 40% uh, former ELs or uh, former ELs with, uh, or temper and 40% former ELs and ELs. So we have a lot of Spanish speaking going on at our school. We have a lot of Korean going on at our school. We have even students that are from Laos that are third and fourth generation, they're not in ESL. So we have a lot of people of color, but it's mostly immigrant, the children of immigrants but we have black Africans that are part of our ESL population over the years. So the, the, the immigrant population at our school is not, is very diverse and it's not all in ESL anymore. Um, so we've hit on prevention a little bit and we're almost out of time, but um, I think we've talked a lot about it, just that students would own their learning, that even, you know, 
their first few years that they just continually have that growth mindset um, every year and that they constantly have a relationship. I think, especially when I started teaching too, um, I noticed this and I feel like some students were like, oh, you know, they're, they're a long time learner, they're out on their own, they'll figure it out, they'll get it. And it's like, no, they need to know the ESL teacher, they need to be in the ESL community. Um, that's crazy. So just that they would own that and that we would own them as part of like, we're building you up, you are part of the ESL community, you, um, we're continually there for you and rooting for you. Um, parent outreach, constantly being in communication with their teachers and their parents. It's a team effort. They can't do it alone, you can't do it alone. Um, and just that the student would, yeah, be a part of their own learning. Um, and I was going to say something else, but I don't remember. But. Um, we know that we don't have an ideal situation, and we've worked together for six years now, and it's taken us six years to figure things out, and there's still things we need to figure out. Um, and RTI is one of those, and how to, to schedule long-term language learners that are on that, you know, that little cusp. They, they almost tested out the year before, you know, and you know they can do this stuff independently, and you're not sure whether, we don't want to over-support them, but we don't want to under-support them. And so really um, helping them, and we had one student that we did support in sixth grade, and we supported in seventh grade, so he got supported in eighth grade, um, but in a less, lesser role because our eighth grade numbers were so huge, we didn't have enough, our, and, and our eighth grade numbers are always really big. Um, but we had built that relationship with him, so he made really good growth in eighth grade. He didn't test out. He, he's still on the cusp, but he's way better off than he was in sixth grade when we, he, he didn't test out. And here's my thing. Some kids are going to make slower growth. But just because they're making slower growth, it's still growth. And this is what I was going to say is I, the whole six years and then, you know, then they're a long-term language learner, it takes seven years in research sets to learn a language, academic language. So I think sometimes you're just making sure the students know, like, not everyone's the same. And if you're growing every year, that's, that's your goal. Because um, I think, the kid, you know, it's easy for them to compare themselves to that student who came two years ago and exited who also had incredibly high academic skills in their native language. So not every kid's the same and that the kids would know that, like that their, their growth is their own. That's their goal in seven years to learn a language. Like I probably wouldn't know Spanish perfectly if I went there for seven years. So. All right, so these are the resources. This is where we got, get a lot of our, um, and this is all through ELL Chat Book Club that I do um, on Twitter. And if you're not, if you are on Twitter and you would like to follow me, I am, I am constantly uh, tweeting out resources and I have a great PLN. I'm at CB Tennyson. If you are not on Twitter, I'll forgive you. <laughs> Seriously. Twitter is a great resource for professional development. I don't get caught up in the politics. Uh, don't let politics scare you away from Twitter. Um, but we've read all of these books, and the activity we did where we, and I kind of messed it up a little bit, where we talk, and then we read, and then we talked, and then we wrote, which ideally you should give a, more of a writing, but we did a group write, um, or we did a language experience write, if you want to call it that. Um, we, uh, that's an activity from Talk, Read, Talk, Write. This is not an ESL book per se, but this, the, 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 the strategies in this book are powerful if you want to build that conversation and writing at the same time and build it up through quality text. Um, unlocking, and Nona has copies of this and this, just so that you know. Um, unlocking English Learner's Potential. I liked it so much, I'm going to use it as my text in my fall undergraduate class my language acquisition class. This one is the one we're about to talk about on uh, ELL Chat Book Club, but I've already read it. It's another really great resource. Um, Larry Falazio's book, uh, he has a great new book out that came out in April. That's more of an ESL. I think it's more of an ESL teacher book. These two books right here are ones that you could learn strategies from and then share with your grade level teachers that you're working with. This is ELL Excellence Every Day. It's by Tanya Ward Singer. Um, it's, this is Corwin. This is Corwin. And I don't remember what publisher this one is. Corwin is like my favorite publisher for uh, books for uh, people like us, professional development books right now. Um, Y'all want to go? We met went a minute over. Does anybody have any questions? And there is another article um, on the Weebly. Uh -huh. If you're interested, it's by this, or the it's same organization, but it, it's really good too, and it's not long if you're interested. So thank you all. <laughs>